absolute pleasure in welcoming you this morning on behalf of the Trelawney Library Advocacy Committee and the Wellness in Motion Gender Equity Team. We have a packed agenda for you this morning and our presenters are Cheryl Bebbington from the National Parenting Support Commission and Mrs. No Miss Nadia McLaren from the Bureau of Gender Affairs. We are looking forward to hearing from them and as we look how to solve the problem of domestic violence. We also have some items to share with you and that leads me to say, I sincerely hope you will enjoy this session. We will now begin with Inspirational Thought by Dr. Moendo. Good morning, everybody. I hope we are having an awesome morning so far. And it is indeed our pleasure to have you with us. For this morning, I want us to stop for a moment and take stock of self, right? We are here today to talk about something important. We are here to feed into others, but we must learn to feed into ourselves, right? And so this morning, I want you to take a deep breath. Relax your mind. Focus on self and the divine. And then when you do that, I want you to acknowledge that the sun would rise this morning, the wind would still blow, and all these things would happen if you were the only human being that woke up today, because you are indeed special to God. He loves you, he cares for you. And so I want you to accept that you are the most special being on the face of this earth at this moment. But then remember now, with that comes a responsibility to be the best you, that you become the best reflection of who the divine is. And so at this moment, you're gonna pause for half of a second, half of a minute, sorry. And you know, in your own space, will speak to your own divine guidance for half of a minute. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy that you have granted us to us today. As we go through, we ask for your guidance. Amen. 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 Thank you, Dr. Mendo. And we'll now ask you to bring greetings. Greetings will now be done by our chair. Okay, again. it's greetings time already. Yes, for me today, it is really Today is our first conversation under the almond tree. And this is the first of many we are hoping to have. We are hoping to do this bi-monthly. And I'm hoping all that are online with us this morning will be a part of it and others will be a part of it. To those who are here with us this morning, I want to say to you, welcome and it's good to have you, right? So we have some persons here with us, keeping within the COVID guidelines. And for those who are online already and those who will to come. Why are we here today? We are here today because we have a question that we need to provide an answer for. So we are being challenged by domestic violence. And then we heard what happened over the weekend again on Father's Day and yesterday. So the communities are plagued and we are looking at you saying that parenting and guidance and how we guide our persons in our community is one of the solution to the problem that we now face and so that's what we are here to look at today we have two awesome um speakers lined up i will not um take over mother moderator's place and tell you who they are she will tell you who they are in a little while but i say to you welcome and we will continue the conversation and of course we'll talk again at the end of the session god bless you oh, no. Well, as Dr. Moendo have just said, we are, in, we are in a crisis, domestic violence. Domestic violence is on the rise in our society. And I've just 
written a poem I would like to share with you. It's called Domestic Abuse. I often wonder why some men beat and mistreat their women, especially when they are frustrated or just simply having a problem. But let's not forget, some women beat their men too. Though it's not so prevalent, the happenings are few. Domestic violence causes so much grief and pain. Sometimes it leaves the victim curled up feeling disdain. It causes separation, isolation, even drives some insane. From the brutal attacks applied, so unbearable, so inhumane. Domestic violence is considered an irrational behavior just to gain control over each other. Why do some men abuse and intimidate their women so? Even though she cries and pleads, please release me, let me go. That non-release from the mental torture brings about stress and pain. It would sometimes leaves her limp, helpless and lame. Is it because you are the man and she's just a woman? You feel you can beat on her with your big brawny hands. Sometimes you even use your feet. Oh, damn it, my brother man, why? Why do you do it? The verbal abuse that comes from your mouth, the degrading words, the screams, the shouts, the disrespect, the threats, the unbearable condition she undergoes just because of your violent emotion. And guess what? The children are also witnessing this. These daily household abuse and fierce conflicts do you realize this is a patterned lifestyle which could re repeat itself in their future? A lifestyle of bullism and violence because this is how they were tutored. What picnicy or what picnic do? So I have been told and the child will repeat this unhealthy behavior in his future household. And so the cycle continues, if there's no amend. So parents, let's make a change. Let's set an example for our children. You know, I spoke to a child just the other day, and as I listened carefully, all she had to say. She said, before my dad was kind and loving, he brought me my first pair of gold studded earrings. He would prepare delicious evening meals that fed us all. We had fun playing games, tennis, cricket, and netball. Sadly, he invited that liquid poison in his blood. Then all hell broke loose. He went mad. In went total confusion, misusing the illusion, the illusion of the loving dad. That loving dad I thought I had. Now I am nervous and scared. My brothers and sisters too. Well, 
my mom's paranoid. She just don't know what to do. I'm so sick and tired, she said, showing me her head. I saw cuts and bruises she received late last night as she tried to part the habitual fight. Another example I have is a, a sister of mine wanted to leave her man, but somehow he unearthed her secretive plan. He went to her house in a jealous rage and brutally attacked and killed her. Was he deranged? I am now beginning to wonder why. Why, why this sudden upsurge of violent behavior in our men? What instigated this urge? Violence against each other is so absurd. I say peace, love and unity is the word. So, Let's use that controlling power to have a loving relationship with each other. Thus making our homes, country, our world, a much safer place instead of a place of hate, fear and disgrace. The status of humankind is democracy. It's our human rights, it's our legacy. Well, I just hope I explained, um, these are all real, uh, real feelings. This is how I see it. And I just hope and pray that we'll be able to do something about it. Now, our next presenter will be introduced by Miss Allison Harvey Williams, who is a trained social worker and a community parent. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Ms. Nardia McLaren, she's the acting director of Community Liaison at the Bureau of Gender Affairs, where she focuses on the implementation of policies in relation to social development, community development, values and attitudes, and other gender related issues to assist with the improvement of the social and economic development of both women and men nationally. Ms. McLaren collaborates with government ministries, departments and agencies, NGOs, and community groups for the delivery and implementation of programs in communities and also to increase awareness on gender-based violence. To increase and to improve communal response to address and reduce gender-based violence. The implementation of these programs is in line with the minister's mandate to achieve gender equality, improve social justice, and to reduce discrimination such as gender-based violence. Nida holds a Master's of Science in social, Sociology, sorry, specializing in social policy and development, and a Bachelor of Science in so Sociology with a minor in Human Resource Development, both from the University, university of the West Indies, Mono. Her mantra is, be the change you want to see in the world, and embodies that through her personal and career life. She likes working with younger persons, where she serves actively as a guide and mentor. The importance of mentors is undeniable. Ms. McLaren passionately guides, directs, and assists with shaping the future for the betterment of our young people. As such, she has served as youth mentor with Community Unite and Youth where she has coached and supported several young ladies from vulnerable communities to make better of themselves and circumstances. Her life and career have been driven by the strong desire to alleviate the suffering 
of the most vulnerable people of Jamaica. As she believes that our efforts now are determining outcomes and opportunities for our own generation and generations to come. Please help me welcome Ms. Nardia Matarin. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope everybody is as excited as I am about today. Oh, yes. Oh. Um, firstly, I want to thank the organizers from the Trelawney Parish Library for hosting such a well-needed session. Thank and you. Right, for hosting such a well-needed session. And I look forward to being invited to others, the Bureau exactly. Um, Dr. Moenda especially, <laughs> he has been following up every day to ensure that this session is a success. So I know that she's dedicated and committed to the process. And I loved how the session opened with us reflecting that we are indeed most special. And as such, we should treat ourselves as special because we are very special. So today I'm going to start off my presentation by showing a video. One second. Okay. Special like that. Hey guys, welcome back to my vlog. Uh, I got here. flowers today. Here. No, it's not my birthday on being special like that. Um, we had an argument last night and he said a lot of cruel things that really hurt my feelings, but things that really hurt my feelings, but I guess he's sorry because he got me these flowers today. I got flowers today. No, it's not our anniversary or any other special day. Last night he threw me into a wall. And choked me. And then beat me till I passed out. I woke up bloody and bruised all over. It's actually a nightmare. I guess he is sorry though, because I got these flowers today. I got, I, I got flowers today. No, it, it's not Mother's Day or any other special day. Last night he beat me again and again. And again, it was worse, much worse than any other day before. He wanted to sleep with me and I'm on my period, so I wasn't up for it. A couple of kicks, punches to the face and he had his way. I got flowers today. And today is actually a very special day. Yeah. It's the day of my funeral. Last night he beat me to death. If only I had the courage and the strength to leave him, maybe I wouldn't have gotten flowers today. Ah, good morning. How was that for you? Very telling. Very telling, uh, right? Uh, one sided. Why one sided? It, it, I, I, I keep seeing um, presentations like this with, the, with, with it being 
about the man, you know, and the woman being the victim. That's what I'm saying. I'm seeing it one sided. I understand what you're saying, but on a percentage level, statistically, it's mostly one sided. So even though men are abused, statistically, sorry, where where the statistic is coming from? These statistics can be found with the JCF. So the Jamaica Constabulary for Statistics Unit collects data of deaths every year as it relates to gender-based violence. So we can check those stats. All right, Alan? Okay. Right. But that's a good observation because we do know that in Jamaica, we experience gender-based violence. Men and women experience gender-based violence. Men might sometimes feel it's one-sided because we both experience gender-based violence, but on a statistical level, based on the nature of gender-based violence and the understanding of what it means to be man or woman in Jamaica, we will have a greater perpetuation towards violence against women in comparison to men. And the types of gender-based violence experienced by a man versus a woman would be different. So anybody else have any observation? Um, this is supposed to be an interactive session. So I know Alan is outspoken. Um, the lady keeps down playing it on the permit, on the basis of the floor is given. And so often we are, we are forgiving and we are forgiving and we are forgiving because um, we receive a token or a gift or something like that. Right. It applies for both male and females. We are reassured in the cycle of violence that the person will change with no real intervention. I am sorry. I didn't mean this. And sometimes we forgive and forgive and forgive until we die. Because most of the persons who have died at the hands of gender-based violence, I don't think they had expected their partners to kill them. I got flowers today. So I'm going to start my presentation. Just Thank you all. You start, just before you start, sorry. And one of our guests inside wants to say something about what she just saw. So I'm gonna give her a little chance to speak. Sure. Mm. Well, um, I want the same problem. Most is abuse, verbal abuse. And um, well, you'd believe people are saying that one is too old to have all this kind of thing. But it's not too old. My husband is 87 and I'm 80 now, just turned 18 March. But we've been having this problem for three years. He's very abusive, verbally. He didn't, he doesn't hit me. But he, he keeps things away from me. He doesn't support me. And he um, abused me in the community. So even now the community and I don't speak to the people in the community. Most of them not speaking to me. And um, somebody said it was a one way. I did hear that there saying that it didn't look like it was two way. Mm -hmm. But the woman, I was quiet. So a lot of time people don't hear me, but they hear him. And he walked down the community and told people, oh, I'm, I had a, a marital problem. I committed adultery, okay? I don't mind telling you guys that. But it was his action why I went to someone else. And he treated, treated me badly because the person I went to is younger than him. And so I'm like, a, a, um, I can't know the word you could use in the community, I'm nobody, according to him. And we've been to, we, we've been to family court many times, uh, I soon finish. Mm -hmm. We went to family court many times and he said he was going and he did not go. Eventually now, and I'm happy to say, the court gave him order to leave on the court of this month, so he's gone. But you know what he did before he left? He took away, locked up the doors and took all the keys away. Don't know where he threw it. And if you see the, the property, so when people are saying it's the one side because they don't know the other side. Mm -hmm. It's true. Okay. It's true. So that, that's my story for now. I'm glad you stopped me to watch that. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you. Uh, all right, yeah. over to you. But um I will share the numbers for the bureau because we have a 
social uh, social workers that assist persons, male and females, who have experienced gender-based violence. Um, you can write down this number and give her no since she's leaving. So she can call a social worker right now. So for females, the helpline to call is 876, of course, 553-0372. That's 553-0372. And if it's a male, because probably her husband will need somebody to speak to as well. They can give him this number. This is specifically for males. It's also 553-0387. So that's 553-0387. At the end of the session, I'm going to share some flyers with you so you can print and put it in the library. All right? I'm going to begin. Right. Persons are seeing the screen now? Persons are seeing Yes, we are seeing Okay, so I'm Narda McLaren. I'm from the Bureau of Gender Affairs, a division within the Ministry of Culture, Gender Entertainment and Sport. We are located in Kingston across the Transport Center which is 59 to Odeon Avenue. We are the first national established nas national machinery in the Caribbean. And we were established in 1972 to advise the government and to integrate women into national development. If we understand the history of Jamaica's understanding of gender, we would understand that in 1972, women who had constraints as it relates to voting rights, owning land, properties, being on certain boards. So this commission was established in order to integrate women into the national development plans. The Bureau is guided by two national documents, which is the National Policy for Gender Equality, which looks at incorporating the needs of men and women into the development plans of Jamaica and the National Strategic Action Plan to eliminate gender-based violence in Jamaica. This plan looks on how different entities, government bodies, um, community, and non-government organization can join in to eliminate gender-based violence. We are guided by four principles of the national policy, that is gender equality and social justice, political leadership and commitment. We, this involves getting commitment at the higher level. Multi-sectoral approach and partnership, such as the one that we're having now with the library, because the Bureau is just one small entity and we need the help and assistance from community-based organization, non-government organizations to eliminate gender-based violence and a participatory approach. So that means all of us have a role to play in eliminating gender-based violence and being that change that we need to see. Um, in 2016, the Bureau was rebranded from the Bureau of Women's Affairs to the Bureau of Gender Affairs. Um, this is so because men and women need to work together if we are to achieve any form of development and if we are to achieve the elimination of gender-based violence, domestic violence is not a man against woman issue or a woman against man issue. It's both of us working together and understanding the needs of each party as we address any development issue. Specifically today, we're looking on gender-based violence. So this presentation, will provide our participants here today on what is gender-based violence. We will look further on domestic violence, highlight the effects of domestic violence, and to explore how we refer and report gender-based violence. This is a video, a public service announcement that we created to share. It was shared in the media 
some time ago, encouraging persons to report if they saw acts of gender-based violence. It was saying under the theme, no excuse for abuse. So in Jamaica, we have a culture that says, um, I accept violence because, or we must lick her because, we must lick him because, we do this because. At the Bureau, we say there is no excuse for abuse. Um, so you can go ahead and have a look at the video now, no excuse for abuse. So because this is an interactive presentation, do you think that there is an excuse or any reason at all for us to be abusive to someone or to accept abuse from someone? I see the head shaking, but I'm not, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. No excuse no. for abuse. So Alan? So you can't do it, they separate. I, I rather not comment on these things. And I realize that most times it's better listening to these forums rather than a comment because it's gonna it's gonna spark something outside of what we what, what we need. So for the purposes of here, I'm just gonna remain silent and just pay keen attention to your presentation, please. All right. Alan, I understand what you're saying, but I like to hear the men's opinion. Um, you hear what is true? Yes, I like it. Hear what is true. Um, by the way, I am I am the I am now a co-chair for a men's group, right? <laughs> Recently appointed. And one of the things that I'm looking at is yeah. how we have dealt with the, the, the matter of domestic violence over the years. As I said earlier. I, I mean, even looking at this presentation, I'm still seeing that it's still one-sided. Um, I heard the, the person earlier commenting wow. on the issue, and I, I think that there, there is a there's a point where we reach in our society where we fail to take accountability for our own actions. So, for example, the female there committing adultery, blaming the partner for the reason why she's doing it, and not taking personal personal accountability and saying no I did that that was wrong that was that was mental abuse on the gentleman or on my husband why didn't I just leave instead of instead of committing adultery and that's what I'm saying is that it's almost as if we're saying look here we're a business board the excuse or we're a business board the reason for what we're seeing so so in my view I mean we'll talk about it but we'll never ever really get to the root of the problem. And that is my concern. But as I'm saying, you know, I, I listen to these presentations often and I try not to speak because you, you always get people bashing you, especially when I give my views and opinion persons right. who don't agree with it. And that's another issue. Why right. is it that you don't agree with something that is being said, but you can't see it as something valuable because why? I'm a member of the society as well. And right. so therefore, if we are to have a conversation, let's have it. But if not, right. you know, let's not. Right. So, Alan. Let me jump in here one minute, please. Hello? Yes, go ahead. So there's always going to be male perspective and female oh, perspective. Oh, one second. Is this Tavia? Yes, this is Tavia. One second, Tavia. I'm going to, I don't want to not 
speak about Alan's point because in formulating this um, this this campaign, this public education campaign called No Excuse for Abuse, all of this was taken into consideration to say, woman no business, but woman feelings, woman do things and don't expect a reaction from man, man do things and don't expect a reaction from woman. But what we realize though in Jamaica is that we normalize a violent response to everything. So we still say, you cheat, you're wrong for cheat. We know that you are wrong for cheat, for cheating. So that gives you a reason too. We at the Bureau still say that there is no excuse for abuse. Right. We still at the Bureau maintain that there is no excuse for abuse. So you are wrong, she's wrong. How are you going to go about it? There's no reason for you to hit her. You're going to seek intervention. Do you want counseling or do you want to leave? Can this situation be remedied? Can this situation not be remedied? If not, both parties far away understand that feelings and emotions are involved. I hurt your feelings that don't mean you must be abusive to me. We understand teeth and tongue must meet but we have to get to a point in Jamaica where we change our culture that normalizes violence as the response to hurt. Because it would be the same thing to say, all right, the man, the thief, something from me, someone just kill him. We cannot go around having a, a society that's like that. I understand we're not holding people accountable and they're not doing things, but is the solution violence? So we still maintain that to say, Yes, your ego is burnt. You got mentally abused, emotionally abused. Seek help. If you want the relationship, seek help. If you don't want the relationship, leave. Um, Tavia? Well, you pretty much said what I was about to say. Um, but I would add that, you know, we should always encourage, you know, perspectives from both parties male and female right. and some of the times when we have these separatist groups like um, the gentleman before said he was co-chair of another group you know and you're sitting in you know same gender forum and you have these expressions or discussion and similarly the women's groups also you know it robs the um the discussion of, of, of good value and, and solution that is intended for all and so that was just my two cents, in addition to what you have said before. So I don't think we should ever take a position to say, keep silent on the matter because you're in a group that is predominantly women or you're predominantly male. No. We are welcoming everybody to the table and your views and whatever you have, even though somebody may disagree with you, right. it is valid and it's important. It's part of the solution. Right. And that's the stance of the Bureau. Um, there are women groups that may have difference in opinions, but if we're to have real change, we have to hear the uninhibited thoughts of men and the uninhibited thoughts of women. How are we going to form real solutions? Because if men are thinking this and women are thinking this, we need to hear both parties. So I'm sorry if persons bashed Alan's views before, but that should be the way where we're silencing somebody's voice that is also gender-based violence silence in a party because of their sex um, it is, I, didn't, I didn't know that it really is i'm experiencing gender-based violence <laughs> um, after nelson nelson has his hand raised after that i'm going to continue the presentation because we don't want to spend the whole day so nelson you can go yeah, ahead. Nelson is a female. It's a female, okay? <laughs> okay, Nelson. Thank you. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, all right. Um, yeah, not a problem, man. Um, just to just say a short thing, maybe not just to Alan, but I don't believe that this should be based on any any person's perspective. Well, it's the Alan says, what about the man's perspective? And maybe I'll say, what about the woman's perspective? I don't think it should be based on any perspective. There should be a common ground that says, love worketh no ill. 
to its neighbor. So whether it's a male or it's a female, whomever is arguing this point, I think it should just be common. You know, Romans 13, 10 says, love worketh no ill to its neighbor. So whether it's a male or it's a female, there should, abs there should be absolutely no violence. So whether the female is, I mean, is being cheated on or vice versa, the end result or the solution cannot be violence because love does not hurt. That's all I want to say. And I think sometimes we are biased in terms of how, when we share our views on this and what about me, you know? Cause even the other day when we had the episode on the television, men were coming out, you know, men, we're, we're getting, um, we're getting, we're getting abused too. Yes, both sexes are, but I believe if we have a common thread or the, com the, the common foundation of love, then nobody will retaliate when the lady was caught in adultery, you know? I mean, what did Jesus do? He knelt and he wrote in the, um, in the sand and he said, he that who doesn't have any sin, you may cast the first stone and nobody could. So the point is he never said, come and stone her. He never agreed to stoning. He never agreed to retaliation. When wrong is done to us, we have to find a way to show love even in spite of that, even in spite of abuse. So I don't believe there's any excuse at all for abuse. There's always a solution, a proper solution to talk it out, to work it out without whether or not we are hurt. We have to be able to control our feelings no matter how serious and sad and cruel the situation is because um, inflicting violence on others or you know um, injecting pain in some way will not cause the situation to be better. It actually worsens the situation. That's just what I want to share. Thank you. I think on that foundation, we can end, right? We can end the presentation, right? Because love working <laughs> no ill to its neighbor. And I believe that as being the truth, irrespective of the sex of the person, man or woman, love should not be violence. So in Jamaica, we say, love me to death. We say, love me to live. So I'm going to continue. Thank you, everybody. So we're going to look on gender-based violence to get a greater understanding of what gender-based violence is. So gender-based violence is any act directed at someone based because of their sex and gender that results in physical, sexual, or psychological harm or suffering. Our local document defines gender-based violence as acts of physical, mental, Social abuse, including sexual violence that is attempted or threatened with some type of force, such as violence, threats, coercion, manipulation, deception, cultural expectations, weapons, or economic circumstances, and is directed against a person because of his or her gender roles and expectations in society. So woman must wash, cook, and clean. Man must provide money if them can do that. Boop, beaten, cussing. Ya no man, ya no woman, ya no good wife, ya no good father. So those cultural expectations that we reinforce daily negates if somebody should be abused. So you're not a good father because you're not no money. You are no one good woman because when we come home, no dinner, no cook. You understand? So our cultural expectations negate a lot of what we normalize and accept as violence. Woman must be virtuous. So can woman are virtuous? That same example that she used earlier, she forget leak. Gender-based violence is violence involving men and women. Females are most times the victims. However, men are victims as well. And it is based in unequal power relations. So most times, me have the money, me have the better job, me have the house, me have the care, and my house, me have better education. Who are you? Right. Types of gender-based violence include trafficking in persons, bullying, sexual harassment, incest, rape, domestic violence, neglect. Persons all look at neglect as a form of gender-based violence. 
because they don't really understand gender-based violence. For example, I'm a senior citizen and I live with my children. They neglect me because me all no no money, just they deliver for them form of gender-based violence. Um, neglecting of children from adults is also a form of gender-based violence. We're going to look closely now on domestic violence. So we have a survey in Jamaica called the Women's Health Survey, which is the first survey in Jamaica that looked on the prevalence of gender-based violence. So in Jamaica, one in four, that mean if 10 women they're right here, so today probably four of them has reported being physically abused by their partner during their lifetime. One fifth of Jamaican women reported being sexually abused before reaching 18. The main perpetrators were friends or acquaintances, then strangers and family members and other parents and siblings closely behind. Almost half of the females interviewed aged 15 to 24 um, said that they were coerced into having sex the first time they had sex or the first sexual encounter they had, they were coerced or forced into doing it. 69% um, of adolescent girls in the age group 15 to 19 justified that still, this is young people talking, you know, that it is okay for a husband to hit his wife if she neglects the children. Other reasons within it, um, persons interviewed to say if she no cook when she come home, she island upon road, she talk to other man, it is justified for the man to hit the woman. Um, exposure to violence as a child. So this is the home now and where both males and females are, are showing, displaying violence, act, whether it be verbally, emotionally, or physically. So exposure to violence as a child is positively correlated to the risk of IPV. So in the future, boys who grow up in the context of domestic violence are likely to be emasculated in the process as they feel as they are incapable of protecting their mothers. So we have this here that says victim today, abuser tomorrow. So it can be both ways. So we grew up in a home where we saw violence. We normalize and think that violence is the way in which we should remedy or deal with conflict, whether it be verbal, emotional, financial, or physical. So persons think that the violence should be a reaction because that's what they grew up seeing. Some persons normalize and think that the violence should be accepted because them grew up and see it. Them not dead, I know nothing. My mother used to cuss my father all the time. So them grew up and cuss for them husband or grew up and see mother or father fighting each other and them grow up and think that is a normal way. Some people accept it. Some people are perpetrators of it because they grew up in a household that saw this. Um, so we say domestic violence is not a private matter. Most of us, when we see domestic violence in the home with people through the window, we not tell nobody. We stay inside and we're quiet, we suffer in silence. We don't, if we are not equipped with the tools, we don't, you know, seek out any help for them. We just think it's a private matter until somebody, it escalates more seriously. Somebody end up a hospital, somebody end up dead. And we all saw it. We all saw this in the news that happened in Kelitz. Who knew if other persons in the community saw, but nobody responded because our culture to say a man or woman business that, and we a business, a them business. So we have this culture that says domestic violence is a private matter, but in order for us to get the real help, we have to intervene. 
If we don't have the tools, you call the person to have the tools and say, you know, I see this. Can't call the bureau. You'd have to go to the police and say, you know, I see this and I think they need help. We're not the police. What we offer is interventions, counseling, speaking to the parties and getting help before it reached to a criminal matter. Domestic violence is defined as any violence that occurs between individuals who are related to intimacy, blood, or law. Domestic violence can be sexual, physical, emotional, psychological, or financial. It impacts or all directly or indirectly. So that means if you're physically, emotionally, or sexually abused, sometimes all of it is related. Domestic violence is one of the sources of violence in Jamaica, which usually results in death. And most times the children are in the house seeing all of this. So if we want to be the change that we want to see, I mean, we have to play our parts and find some way in which we can. This session now is good because it increases our um, understanding of what domestic violence is so we can reach out and speak to other persons. Intimate partner violence is different than domestic violence. So domestic violence can be everybody within the house. So intimate partner violence, no, or spousal abuse is described as any violence that occurs sexually, physically, emotionally, psychologically, or financially by an intimate partner or spouse. So domestic violence covers everything spousal abuse, sibling abuse, elder abuse, and child abuse, because domestic violence is violence under a domestic situation. Physical abuse, so that is intentionally applying force to the body so that injury is sustained. Sexual abuse, forcing a partner into unwanted sexual practices. Emotional or psychological abuse, which is very normal in Jamaica where people don't see as form of abuse. Verbally attacking, insulting or ridiculing a person's sense of self and undermining their self-image, self-worth and self-confidence. Financial abuse, refusing to work or share money, controlling or taking the victim's money. Forms of emotional abuse, which is very important that some of us don't look on and we don't understand the seriousness of emotional abuse. Emotional abuse, emotional abuse is so, they must say hot, it feel like physical abuse. So it's the name calling, the insults, go you're good for nothing, you're not a sense, you're worthless, over time, every day. Continuous criticism, extreme jealousy or possessiveness, isolation from family or friends, monitoring where a person goes and who the partner spends time with, withholding affection as punishment. A lot of women do this. They're married. The man them complain about this a lot. So them get cold and withdrawn and them the business about the man no more because of something. It might not necessarily be abuse, but you know, them have some differences. So the woman withhold their affection as a form of punishment. Man do it too. Threaten to hurt your partner, children, family, or loved ones. Humiliating your partner. Expectation of partner to seek permission for everything. That's a form of emotional abuse. The cycle of abuse. So a lot of persons always say, when somebody's in an abusive relationship, why them don't leave? But them don't understand the dynamics of the cycle of abuse. And persons look on the cycle of abuse like, look on persons to say, um, when they're in an abusive relationship, them are idiot, them for just left. But it's way deeper than that. 
Because remember, the person you're in the abusive relationship is not a stranger. Is your husband, is your uncle, is your brother, is your baby father. So it's somebody that you love, somebody that you want to spend your life with or be with. So persons who are in an abusive situation enter into this cycle of violence that sometimes don't allow them to leave. So one, there's tension building. So the tension increase, breakdown of communication, the victim becomes fearful and feels the need to, you know, appease the abuser. So something go wrong, right? As so no one, you do something. So you, do, you walk on eggshell because you're afraid of this person. So within that cycle, then you have the verbal, the emotional and physical abuse, the anger, the blaming, the arguing, the threats, and the intimidation because you do something wrong. So them react after you've done something wrong. After you do something wrong, the reconciliation, the abuser apologizes, gives you roses, chocolate, tell you, me no do it again, are you make me do it? Why you, why you can't just change? Why you go talk to him? Why you can't just cook your food? Why you can't come off of the phone? You just depend on social media so every day. You do work every day. Blames the victim, denies that the abuse occurs, or says that it wasn't as bad as the victim claim. Shaman, I just a look like, oh, you're going to like, me, I go kill you. So that's the reconciliation, them good and them sweet again. The calm, the incident is forgotten, them good and lovey dovey, no abuse is taking place. We call this the honeymoon phase until it happens again. So the person is in this cycle of abuse. Within this cycle, person, it might not happen like one, two, three, four, as always described. You can have the incident and then them reconciliate and then there's a calm or there are incident and there's a calm. The cycle it varies. But we have, to we have to take into consideration that these persons are in a relationship by different ways. So you have to take in consideration those emotions too within this cycle of abuse. Um, so we're going to look on now, when you're in a relationship, what do you think is unhealthy and healthy forms of relationships? Anybody? Characteristics that you would say are healthy or unhealthy features in a relationship. All right, I don't see nobody. So in a healthy relationship, there's compromise because nobody is perfect. You have your own hobbies, you support each other, you have your own friends, you have your own interests. Both parties are equal. So it's not like me see myself more important than you. We are both equal. We respect each other. There's a friendship. We give each other space. We love each other and we encourage each other. In Jamaica, I don't know if it's our culture or other persons. Once we are involved with somebody, we own them. We have to know where they might do, where they there at all times. We no longer want them to have friends. You are my only friend. I should be your only friend. Your money is my money. I control everything that you have. And if you want to do nothing with your friend outside of me, that is cheating. So we become like obsessive and that is not a healthy form of relationship. So when you do that knowing now you boxing the person with your obsessive behavior, the persons feel trapped, mistrust because why you have your friend in? A cheat, I got cheat. So there's distrust, they feel scared, you criticize them, you isolate them from them friends, them do have no choice. We give them ultimatums. It's either you do this or that. Me not cook no food, me not do that because you not do this. 
You accuse them all the time of cheating. You want to know where they are every day, every hour and hour. You check them phone, you check them Facebook, you hide in a bush. You start them, you call them and ask them. So how oh, many you're in a dog a bark? I wish I tell them. So those are unhealthy forms of relationship, obsessive behavior. And we normalize that in Jamaica, like that's normal in relationships. All right. So we normalize obsessive behavior as normal in Jamaica as it relates to relationships. Not thinking about the person as an individual. Some are married now, you know, I have no more friend. Just me and you. So we have that obsessive behavior that is unhealthy. Because at the end of the day, we are individuals and we all have individual needs that we want. All right, red flags in relationships. He or she checks your cell phone. He or she doesn't let you see your family and friends. Accuses you of being unfaithful. In red flags again, insults you in public. Makes you engage in uncomfortable sexual activities. Try to control your money. Trying to hurt you and your family. Blames you for the abuse. Limits your movements. Any other red flags in relationships? Wait, why, why is check on you very frequently a part of that? Isn't that loving and, and tender care? To check on your partner regular? I know say check by you go <laughs> in abusive relationship. May I go tell you our instance of cases that we have. We have cases where the victim can't go nowhere, nowhere, nowhere at all, nowhere, no supermarket, no church, no call, no nothing, without the partner being there. If the person want to talk, they must have to look upon the person for talk, or else when they go on, it's something different. Once they leave the house, they call them. Let me hear your background. I always say, you're yeah, there at supermarket. Oh, me, your dog a bark. Oh, dog a bark. Who, you want that? You don't want that, Alan? As a healthy relationship? All right. No, no comment. No comment. Okay. So <laughs> it's, not, it's not the lovey dovey. Hi, honey, you reach to work. Gone. Or call lunchtime or so on. It's so on real stalking. Because the person is trying to control the person. And you have relationships like that. Them bug the person's phone, bug the person's car, clone the person's WhatsApp. Right. So it's that kind of obsessive behavior that I'm talking about. Effects of domestic violence. Remember, you're, you're encountering all of this on a daily basis, you know. Anxiety. You just walk and you look behind you because if you ever tell him, say, or her, say, you there somewhere in a day, day and the person show up and no say, the, the altercation will come. So it causes anxiety, sleep disturbance, nightmares, insomnia, low self-esteem. Low self-esteem to the point where you're not even know your work no more. Because if you get up every day and somebody I tell you say, you're worthless, you're good for nothing, you're not come out to nothing, your head dry, you're ugly. After a time, if you are not strong, if this is somebody that you value their opinion strongly, they should be a loved one, a safe haven, and they might tell you them something. Yeah. Me just me your people tell people you're sick my stomach. Me, it's here, just the sight of you alone upset me. You can't hear that every day? Chronic depression, chronic fatigue, post-traumatic stress disorder, suicidal tendencies, death, low work productivity. You got to work. You're not even there work because you're in your mind. HIV and AIDS, other sexual transmitted diseases. Persons might wonder how oh, HIV and AIDS and other sexually transmitted diseases come in. You can't negate condom use because 
the person run things. If you do, if you talk about condom use, you get too lick. So that increases HIV and AIDS and other sexually transmitted diseases. Indecisiveness, breakdown in healthy communication, prostitution, fear, prostitution because you have low self-worth. You know nobody. So you just succumb to that. Fear of sexual intimacy because you're afraid of man. You're afraid of woman. So you just run your body. Both parties, this something to both men and women because the woman make him feel like him and nobody. Man, this something to man. Make him feel like him and nobody. Same, just have enough woman. He no want nobody. He not get close to nobody. Miscarriages. Why don't survivors leave? Fear of retaliation, lack of means of economic support, concerns for their children, love and hope that the partner will change, stigma or fear of losing custody of children associated with divorce, lack of support from family and friends. Ridicule should be there and status. Enough people not tell nobody because them no one, nobody knows it. Them husband or them wife who is this or that with all the title or not is abusing them. Them no want nobody laugh after them, look down upon them, so them stay. Um, how can you help a victim? So if you know anyone that may be going through a domestic violence situation, ask them. Don't wait for him or her to come to you because of those reasons said before. Them nanga come. Them afraid. Them shame. Them embarrass. Earlier, the lady spoke about she being abused because she committed adultery. Not a lot of people will say that because they would be embarrassed to say that. So most persons in situations like these, them nanga talk. And most times persons don't talk until them dead. As the video that I showed earlier, he brought me roses. She didn't talk. She stayed that she endured it until she died. So you can ex express genuine concern for them. Don't judge or blame them. Say, yeah, man, you forget Likaya or yeah, man, you forget she for cussy off because you're not no money, you know, see a what this. <laughs> Um, listen and validate, say listen attentively, listen to their concerns. Don't pressure them or pressure him. You offer help. You can't give advice. You're not a counselor. You're not a trained expert in the field, so you can't offer help. All you offer help is calling the relative agencies or if they want to go to church or they want to go to somebody that they trust to intervene. So you offer that help. You know, tell them, say, hey, lift the boy, lift the girl. That is not your place. You offer help and you strengthen them to give them the tools to deal with whatever they're going through. And your support is our her decision. It will place conditions on your support. Like I say, yeah, man, that's why I not help you again because I tell you to lift the boy. I'm telling you to lift the girl and you're still dead. Eh? I not help you. You don't want nothing because they don't know what the person is going through in that relationship. And as what I expressed earlier, remember that it's not a foreign entity they're with. They are with their husbands, their baby fathers, and their loved ones. So there are different dynamics that are in play. So you'd have to offer help. Um, I have two hands that are raised. Um, the National Parenting Commission can go and then we will get take Nelson. So I want to ask, what if you're seeing the abuse and hearing it, but the individual does not want any help? There's nothing to do. Okay. If you ask, you express concern, listen, validate. There's nothing you can do. We have cases here where somebody has experienced or seen it secondhand and they call us and we call them and we tell them all the options available and we explain to them and them say, miss, 
Thank you, but I do not need your help. You can't do nothing until them come to them senses and come back to us again, because they cannot force them. We just give them, we just offer the help how we can, as best as all we can to give them the tools. All right, Nelson. Oh, Nelson, Ann was up and she didn't take it down. <laughs> All right. Um, this, I think this goes into what you said before, don't be a bystander because we are all agents of change. Me, personally, because I, I don't know, I think I need to be the change that I need to see in the world. So sometimes when I see a situation, I don't know oh, for, 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 if it's not at work and I see it on the road, I see it in my community and I don't know how to, how to help. I got to talk to somebody else, but I not leave it. I not going to say, oh, I know my business, I know me, I know me, I get lick, I know me, I get verbally abused. I try and see how I can intervene if I can call bureau or another agency for come and talk to the community, everybody in the community, just to get that person involved, then I do that. Or if I can put flyers on the community notice board, I try make them read it or so on. If I can talk to them one away and not in no crowd to make them feel embarrassed or not in a, a, an embarrassing tone or an attacking tone, I say, you know, no say enough to do this, you know, no say enough to do that. But, you know, try to build a respectful conversation with them and eventually we will get there and see how I can help. Tavia has a hand raised. You can go ahead, Tavia. Um. It is sad to say, and maybe I shouldn't bring this up, but you know, some of the entities and the individuals who you expect would be agents of change and are busy giving people instructions and advice on um, abuse of any kind are the very ones who are really not agents of change. Because I happen to sit in a church audience and hear a minister of religion suggested that um, statistics showed, and, and just had, as Alan had said earlier, you know, I don't know how we reference and how we validate these, these statistics, that most of the rapes that, that have taken place, are, are taking place, is as a result of improper dressing. Right? Clearly, insensitive to his audience and who might be a great victim in that audience and what have you. And so, I don't know. So the expectation is for places and persons like these to be, you know, better agents of change. And it's not happening. Tavil, it's sad, but we expect a lot from persons, but it just show the level that the person is on so obviously that pastor needs to be sensitized so to change that narrative because that is wrong muslims with them face cover from head to toe get raped so clothes don't affect somebody getting raped what affect the person getting raped is a rapist raping somebody because they want to rape the person. So with that, it just shows that the person needs to be sensitized more on the issue because obviously they don't know better because they wouldn't say that. It's sad to say, but we are part of a culture and the culture is a part of us. So those narratives are repeated by a lot of persons because they are from the Jamaican culture that believes certain things. So if you want to invite us to, the church to do a presentation specifically on the rape, we can. Um, there's legal policy frameworks that guide how we intervene with domestic violence. 
You have the Child Care and Protection Act, Sexual Offenses Act, and Domestic Violence Act, and the Offenses Against the Persons Act. Most Jamaicans do not know what these things mean, so they don't know how to protect themselves, but these exist. Um, how to get help. We know that you can call the police and you can call the Bureau of Gender Affairs. If it's child, they call the Child Care and Protection, the CPSFA, Child Care and Protective Services Agency. If someone is raped, you call SISOCA. If somebody's a victim, you call the Victim Services Division. And now you know that government has a national shelter. So if persons are in an abusive relationship and there is no place to go, there's a national shelter available for victims of gender-based violence. And the national helpline numbers where persons can text, call, WhatsApp, send please call me too. We have helplines specifically available for men and females. I gave the numbers earlier. If you want to take the number again, it's there. It's 553-0372 for women. And for males, it's 553-0387. We have a host of persons calling. Man call them say, you know me have anger management problem. I mean, I know all for management temper naturally. We need help. Man call and say, you know, they want to take my children away from me because I don't work. And, and you know, in a Jamaica as a man, if you know, if you're not no money, they don't want to play an active role in the child's life. So we had to talk to, you know, them together, both man and woman, help the man get a job through the Ministry of Labor and those things. So we are there to help for issues such as that. Right, I, I, I spoke about these earlier. These are the numbers for places that they can call to get help. Victim Services Division, if you're a victim of gender-based violence and you want to take out a protection order or a court order, the Victim Services Division offered that help. Victim support help, right? Assist you with courts, et cetera. The Child Protection and Family Services Agencies affect, works with the children who have experienced gender-based violence. Um, any questions or answers? All right, so I don't see. No, 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 don't go. We have two questions from the floor here. I'm gonna give the opportunity to come and ask. Sure. Yes, good afternoon. How do you have a victim who has resorted to scanning the partner's phone because that victim has found out that she is being emotionally abused through cheating? So I heard you mentioned earlier where it is, it is a red flag for somebody to be scanning their partner's phone, right? But if this is a case where that person who has no scanned the partner's phone was a victim of physical abuse or um, um, cheating or a fear, how do you help that person? I don't understand the question. Yes. You're saying the person needs help because they have encountered or is going through emotional abuse now and have gone through physical abuse before. That's what you're saying? No, let me repeat. So the person, for example, I am the person. I was abused. I was cheated on, right? So I no longer trust my partner. So I resort to scanning his phone to watch him so I know what's happening in his life. How do you help me as the victim? So I'm going to ask you now. Understand? No, yeah, man, I understand you perfectly. You think that is a healthy relationship? No, it's not. I know that it's not. But how do you help the person since the person is the victim and that 
person is doing something that, you know, is a red flag behavior. So you're saying the partner cheated. Right. And that resulted in you hypothetically searching them phone. Right. So I'm going to tell you if both parties should get help. Because trust right. is very Exactly, I know that. But right. if the victim reaches out to you, how do you help the victim? It well, would be a conversation between both parties. Okay. Right. And the person would speak to the social worker. I'm not a social worker. So <laughs> the social worker would offer their trained intervention to the person. Because it could not be a one-sided approach. Right. That's not right. a healthy relationship. And for the relationship to get back to a healthy state, both parties have to have trust. All right, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can go ahead. The other chair person changes her mind. Change. Um, I saw something in the chat. Let me see it. Let me see what was in the chat. So the person said they called the number for, for men and incoming numbers were restricted. I think at that point, one time, I think there was a specific time where there was some issues with all the ministry's phones, including those helpline numbers. So at that time, the numbers were restricted, but they're back up now. So that it was just that specific instance where all the ministry's phones, we weren't getting any calls or nothing at all. But that issue has since been rectified. Tavia? Okay, uh, my question is, um, what is the reach of your ministry? And how do you sensitize in the areas and to the folks that need it the most? This kind of education that we are getting here today, um, being mindful of the fact that some people are not even aware that they are in an abusive situation. All right, good question. So at the Bureau, we have different ways. First of all, may I get thought there, people don't want to hear nothing. Certain information for them is not interesting. And this is a government entity, government information, they find it boring to begin with, because it's not the, dance all and it's not entertaining for them could you what, partner with those who can get it out um you know to near to the community level no man i'm going to tell you what we do okay. partnering before i get to there so we have a community liaison unit this unit where i'm the acting director for we do community sessions with community organizations, churches, male groups, everybody from its community settings. We are invited or we invite ourselves. Um, we have been doing that since the inception, but since COVID and those restrictions that were placed on community sessions, we are doing those community sessions via Zoom for the most part. But we have resumed since the last two weeks since the prime minister gave us the go ahead. So we've had community walkthroughs and sensitizations. In the past two weeks, we have been in St. Mary specifically because you were invited there by their, the police there because there's a higher rate of domestic violence in, in the communities in St. Mary. So I've, we have been in St. Mary twice per week since the last two weeks. We have our social media so for persons who do not come to the social media, the comment engagement, we share like information on our social media pages, on Instagram, and at on our Facebook. 
and persons other than we inviting ourselves, persons always can take the opportunity to invite us to their own communities. As it relates to partnering with artists, um, that is kind of tricky. We work with several artists where, you know, we help rehabilitate them and help them to share the message of positive love, no abuse, no gender-based violence. You would have heard some of those on the radio so far. Yeah, so we do all those community engagements. We partner with artists. We partner with different influential persons. We have public education campaigns that we run on the radio. We share information in the print media such as Glean and Observer. But as I said, we might be sharing this information, but if it's not exciting to people, they might not be interested in seeing it. But yeah. we do do that. Sorry, but um, I was thinking of partnership to in a broader aspect, you know, there are various touch points. So say somebody turn up at the hospital, at the police station, or wherever they turn up, an abused person or a victim or whatever, and if it is in their best interest and with the permission, would they make that call to you? Would they ask for your intervention on, on behalf of that person? Right, no. So for the most part, we partner with the police. That's what I was telling you. For example, us partnering with the St. Mary Division Police. So for the most part, most of the agencies are aware of the Bureau of Gender Affairs and we partner with each other. Right, so that was the final question. And I thank you so much. And I want to, Alan, <laughs> last question. Yeah, I'm following the protocols, you know. Last All one. Right, so just, time up. just, just to open. All right, next time. No man, say it and then because I was told one more person and that one person is you. Right, so I'm just gonna make two comments. Um, right. Earlier, it, lady that came on, I, I would have, I would have loved to given her my personal experience with that situation, but it's just simple. Um, persons are afraid to seek counselors, but counselors they do work relation there are a lot of relationship um counselors out there that can help you to build up a relationship to where you can have trust again cheating is not the end of a relationship like how most individuals would believe right i it happened to me and right now i'm back in a place where i my partner trusts me again i never well i never needed to go to counseling i i, I can share that story after as it relates to getting in touch with the um with the group with the with the brewer, I I I want to do that because I know that there there is a carcass. Um, but what I do notice is that from time to time when we're supposed to have these meetings, something or the other gets into the way, and I am one of one of those gentlemen who is really getting annoyed with that. I think if it is that we're serious about doing this thing, we have to have no excuse when it comes on to having these type of discussions. There's literally no excuse. I don't want to hear that this come up, that come up, make it happen. So I just like to make that comment. And then when I'm hoping that when I reach out, because our men's group, you know, we're building and I tell the gentlemen every day that look, we, 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 we attend these forums because we want to make ourselves more aware of what is happening within our society. So I'm looking forward to reaching out to the bureau i'm inviting you to come to maybe one of our presentations where you can share some of the what you did today because i really enjoyed it and um that's what i have to say thank you you're most welcome so that is the end of my presentation love work it no ill to its neighbor i still remember that and we are available for contact if you want to invite us to your community to your church to your organization. Thank you. Okay, and we want to thank Ms. McLaren for that lovely presentation. And we do have a gift for you. If you were in person, you'll get it, but we'll get it to you. But I want everyone to see the gift that you'll be getting. 
So the gift that you'll be getting is a book, Lessons from a Place of Pain, written by one of our own members of our organization here, Sophia Lishu Palmer. A matter of fact, she's a person that came and asked the question on behalf of the, someone. And so this is a gift that we'll be giving to you and we'll get it to you in short order after this session. And I know you'll enjoy the reading and you will share the information with others. Thank you so very much. Sure, thank you. Our next presenter, Ms. Cheryl Bebbington. Now we're gonna have Ms. Williams to introduce her to us. Good afternoon, everyone. Ms. Cheryl Bebbington is currently employed to the National Parenting Support Commission, an agency of the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information in the capacity of social worker. In this role, Ms. Bebbington is responsible for providing psychosocial support to our nation's parents to empower them to utilize effective parenting practices. Ms. Bebbington has a combined 15 years experience locally and internationally in social work. She has worked within marginalized communities, serving individuals and families from across the world. Her specializations have been in frontline work, program management, harm reduction, and group facilitation. Through her 15 years experience, she has been committed to providing individualized service and that supports the dignity and worth of each individual and family. Ms. Bebbington holds a Master of Social Work and a combined Bachelor of Social Work and Bachelor of Religious Studies. Her professional interest lies in trauma and resiliency. Personally, Ms. Bebbington enjoys spending time with her children on the beach, traveling, exploring new cultures, and sharing life with others. Please welcome Ms. Bebbington. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Harvey Williams, for the welcome and for introducing me. I appreciate it very much. Um, I would really like to take the time to say thank you on behalf of the National Parenting Support Commission to Dr. Mwendo, to members of the Trelawney Published Library, as well as to the members of the Trelawney Library Advocacy Committee and the Wellness in Motion Gender Equity Team for the invitation to take part in this very important discussion this afternoon. I'd really like to say thank you to Ms. Joy um, Lewis. I'm not sure if I pronounced your last name right, but um, your poem yeah. that you shared at the very beginning, um, I found it very, it was very well-rounded and um, really highlighted even the importance of parenting in, um, in preventing domestic violence in the future. So thank you so much for that, that poem. I would like to give greetings to um, Ms. Nardia McLaren, Acting Director of Community Liaison for the Bureau of Gender Affairs, to my colleagues at the National Parenting Support Commission, um, Mr. Garland McDonald, our Director of Corporate Services, Ms. Cherie Brown, our social work, one of our social workers, to Ms. Andrine Taylor, um, our Quality Assurance Officer, and to um, our student, Ms. Shade Thomas, as well, who are here. And also, I'd really like to say thank you to you parents um, and me community members for being here this afternoon um, to partake in this really important discussion. This afternoon, we're gonna discuss domestic violence through the parenting lens and how parenting can um, help prevent domestic violence from occurring in the future. To begin with, um, I'm asking that everybody keep their microphones muted. Um, for if you can, please come on the camera. It's helpful to be able to see who it is that I'm presenting to. Also, um, to feel free to utilize the chat and the emoji icons at the bottom and to participate. There are going to be times where I am going to ask questions. And so I would love if you could share your responses in the chat and I'll read them out as we go along. We'll save um, questions for the end of the presentation to be able to, um, to flow through the information, um, but do not hesitate to respond to any questions asked because it's really important for you as community members to come away um, having learned something or having learned how to help prevent domestic violence in our future generations. 
to begin with by raising your, um, well, actually first, before we go on, I know it's been a bit long, but who's excited to kind of have this next part of our discussion? You can show me by using the emoji icons at the bottom. So thumbs up, clapping hands. Um, I think there's a little fireworks icon. I see a thumbs up fireworks. Yes. <laughs> so only two people are excited to move on. Three, <laughs> excellent. Um, again, by way of either raising hands or giving a thumbs up, prior to today, who has heard about the National Parenting Support Commission? We are an agency within the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information that was established in 2012 by an act of parliament when the National Parenting Support Commission Act was passed. Our mandate is to implement the National Parenting Support Policy in a quest to increase parental involvement in the education system. So our job is to strengthen the relationship between the home and the school, because research is very, very clear that when parents are involved in their child's education, children perform better academically, and all of those positive behaviors that we want to see in a school setting, they also increase. The National Parenting Support Commission Act defines a parent broadly to include anyone who has the duty of care for a child. Parents include those who have given birth, adopted, or are serving as guardians. So if this afternoon you are here and you are an auntie, an uncle, a grandparent, and you have your niece, your nephew, or your grandchild living with you, then the National Parenting Support Commission Act considers you a parent. This now gives you a duty of care towards that child or towards those children. The duty of care is to look out for the rights and interests of the child, to ensure that they are loved and provided with the resources that they need to thrive and ensure that ch the child is safe and protected. And we believe that when these duties are fulfilled, then children will reach their God-given potential. This afternoon, we're going to develop an appreciation for the role of parenting in breaking the cycle of domestic violence. We're also going to learn of how domestic violence impacts children and discover resources available to support survivors of domestic violence and their families, some of which you've already heard in the previous presentation. To now set the stage for understanding how parenting um, can be used to prevent domestic violence, we're gonna go into a theorist by the name of Albert Bendor, who was a psychologist. He developed a, a theory called social learning theory. In conducting research and under trying to understand how children start to act and engage in behavior, they did a study where they brought children into a room, put onto a TV, um, somebody who was beating a doll. When the video was finished, they gave the children dolls. What they observed was the chil all the children in the room started to beat those dolls. So without anybody having to tell the child what to do, just by watching a video of someone beating a doll, the children immediately started to beat the dolls. What he further learned is if nobody corrected those children, those children would continue with the same behavior and continue to beat those dolls. If they were praised for it or laughed and encouraged, then the children would continue to beat the dolls. But if somebody corrected them or said, no, this is what you're to do. You're supposed to love baby. Oh yes, loving baby, what a good child you are. Then the children would stop that behavior and do the new behavior that was introduced. What I'm wanting us to take away from understanding Bandura's research is that a child in environment is in, a child is influenced by the environment that we create for them and then are influenced by the model or the behavior that they are being seen modeled by them by adults, by their parents, their teachers, and people on the on the that they interact with on a daily basis. As they see these behaviors, it now then starts to shape their beliefs, their values, their attitudes, and their behaviors. And then what Bandura goes on to say is that then there becomes this interaction. 
So the individual is shaped by the environment and those who are displaying, who are modeling behaviors, but then they, as they start to take on those behaviors, it now starts to shape the environment. So there's this continuous ongoing interaction between the individual, others in the environment, and the environment. So the takeaway that we need to understand to be able to prevent domestic violence in the future is for as parents to ask ourselves and for broader community to say, what kind of environment are we creating for our children? And how as parents do we now start to change the behaviors that we are modeling for our children? Because it's through that that they, it shapes how they interact. What we know from other theorists is, is when children are born, the very first place in which they learn um, behavior, they learn about themselves, is within that intimate family environment. And by around, and all of the interactions that occur within that environment. And by around the age of six or seven, um, they have formed what they call interning, internal working models. Meaning, quite simply, that their patterns of relationships are already established by as young as age five, six, and seven. So it really highlights that the environment that we create as parents for our children are extremely influential in determining their emotional, physical, social, psychological, spiritual well-being. And that it, it now sets a course for how they interact with the broader world when they leave the family and then start to establish their own families. Intimate partnered violence, as we had learned previously, or um, and what we know in Jamaica as domestic violence is any behavior with an intimate relationship that causes physical, psychological, or sexual harm to those in the relationship. I'm not gonna repeat because we had learned in the previous presentation about examples of what physical, emotional, sexual, financial abuse looks like. I'm gonna come back and now ask you parents and you community members that are here this afternoon, who does domestic violence affect? So please type in the chat who domestic violence, who you feel domestic violence affects. Anyone? Everybody, yep. Parents, children, relatives, yep, everybody. Yes, you're right, it does affect everybody. It affects the whole of society, the children, and the children are our most vulnerable, and everyone. Now the statistics that I focused on were more about women, and we've heard some of these statistics before, the Women's Health Survey in 2016 showed that a quarter of Jamaican women have experienced physical or sexual violence in their life. So that's one in four women, one in four women have experienced physical violence by a male partner, and one in four women report being sexually harassed during their lifetime. Of those women who have experienced physical violence, more than a third of them have suffered injuries. Now, women have children, and sorry, let me pause and note, especially because um, Mr. Carter previously had, had addressed this and asked this question. Domestic violence does affect males, and males are victims of domestic violence. It's just the statistics are not as high, which begs, there's a lot of questions that can be asked about why the statistics are not high, but sadly, we just have, we work with the research in which we have, and hopefully one, may, one day we can explore um, if it's gen, genuinely because the statistics are really low because the occurrences are much lower or if there might be other contributing reasons as to why we don't hear of men being victims of domestic violence more frequently. But either way, whether it's males or females, children are still involved in the mix because domestic violence happens within the home. 44% of children who were, uh, of women who were victims of domestic violence witnessed the abuse. It's estimated that in an average of 60% of households in volatile communities within Jamaica, 
witnessed the abuse of their mothers by fathers and stepfathers. Of those children, one out of 10 have been exposed to repeated physical abuse of their mothers. So these children are seeing their mothers being abused physically on multiple occasions. What the research doesn't talk about is how many are, well, we can assume that 66%, they may not be seeing it with their eyes, but they are aware that the abuse is happening within their homes. And just because they're not seeing it with their eyes, it does not mean that it's not impacting um, their development and impacting them on a broader scale. So now I'm gonna come back to you as parents and you as community members. How do you think domestic violence is affecting our children? I see Nelson saying um, earlier that it starts in the home and then there's a ripple effect, yes. How do you think domestic violence affects our children? Forms their opinions on how males and females interact, that's right. It affects their learning, excellent. Their emotional instability, yep. Beautiful, if they're in person, I would give, I like to throw candies to people when they, when they do well, that's an, exactly. Exactly. I think I saw one more. Forms their values. That's right. It does form their values. Exactly. Brilliant. Domestic violence affects our children holistically. It affects them mentally, which is how they think about themselves and see themselves. It affects them emotionally, which is now how they feel about themselves and others, it affects their social, their social health, which is now how they interact with other children, with adults in their homes, within the school settings, and as they go on the road to um, every day. It affects their, their spiritual health, which is how they interact with a higher being, which is where they start to derive a sense of meaning and purpose for their life. It affects their academic performance, and it affects even their brain development. When children are born, there's only one part of their brain that is, is, is mature, and that's the basic response of fight or flight. The rest of the brain develops as they experience the world. So based on the interactions in which they have with other um, individual humans, as well as the environment that has been created, the brain doesn't actually mature until, until about the mid twenties. So all of these things and every domestic violence impacts that brain and changes the structures of their brain um, in a negative way. When children are exposed to domestic violence, um, as we learned from Bandura, social learning theory, as, and as a parent already said, it shapes their values, their beliefs, their sense of purpose. It shapes how they feel they're to conduct their relationships. Um, children who have been exposed to domestic violence can display irritability, have sleep problems, fear being alone. Um, it, they can cause them to become immature in their reasoning abilities and delay their development. Their language development can be stunted. They can have poor concentration. They can start to become aggressive and be seen as disobedient and having other antisocial behaviors. They can experience anxiety and depression um, and start to act out in having other violent behaviors. They develop a low frustration for um, low frustration level and tolerance for stress. And you can see eating problems and children becoming passive and withdrawn. In infants who have been exposed to domestic violence, they tend to have sleeping and feeding disorders that can lead to, um, to poor weight gain. For children who are of the preschool age and are witnessing domestic violence, they commonly show withdrawn social behaviors and they have heightened anxiety and are more fearful. When we're looking at school-aged children, research has shown that they perform 12.2% lower than their peers who are not exposed to domestic violence. Specifically in the Jamaican context, children who have been exposed to domestic violence have higher incidence, instances of dropping out of school. Children who are exposed to domestic violence also have to learn how to cope with feelings of sadness, anger, fear, and children cope either by using what they call externalizing behaviors or internalizing behaviors. 
Externalizing behaviors means that you're starting to see it come out behaviorally. So they're taking it out on other people. Internalizing behaviors means that they're keeping it inside of themselves, which is where you start to see more sleeping problems, more depression, more um, social withdrawal, um, being socially withdrawn, high school dropping out. What the research shows is that boys tend to show more externalizing behaviors and girls tend to have more internalizing behaviors. And one of the ways in which boys externalize their emotions in which they're feeling is through becoming bullies themselves or starting to become more disobedient and more aggressive. And this can happen, the bullying behaviors can happen as early as in basic school by targeting other female students and some male students. The greatest impact of domestic violence um, for children is in that parent-child relationship. What we know is that parent-child relationship is crucial and vital for the healthy growth and development of a child and helping them to transition into adulthood and into um, having their own families. What's important is that we develop positive parent-child relationships that are based on love, appreciation, value, nurturance, structure, the, the elements of effective parenting that we're gonna learn about, but it's a safe relationship and it's a respectful relationship where children feel that they are loved and valued for who they are and accepted. When domestic violence and, and that they're safe physically and emotionally. When domestic violence occurs, it shakes it up. No longer is that foundation firm, it's a, now a shaky foundation. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know if when they come home, they're gonna see an argument between mom and dad and maybe it's dad um, abusing mom or maybe it's mom abusing dad, but either way, they don't know what to expect. Also, some children start to come and stand in the way. They try to protect whatever parent, whichever parent is being abused. And when they're not able to, it then affects how they feel that they can control their environment. What is important for us to understand is that children look to their caregivers for safety and for self-regulation relation. And what they need is they need consistency, love and acceptance so that they can grow to be healthy. But when they're seeing one parent abuse the other parent, that parent is no longer safe for them because that parent is now harming another significant caregiver for them. And then what happens is that the person who is being abused often are not available for the child to be able to process what is happening or help them with their other needs because they're trying to recover and understand why the abuse is continuing and, and what happens and what they're going to do and everything that comes with having been a victim of domestic violence. So it's, under, it's important for us to be able to understand social learning theory and how children start to model behaviors for prevention, understand how domestic violence impacts our children, and then to be able to understand what the role of the parent is so that we can start to move towards not just um, restoration in families that are experiencing domestic violence, but move towards prevention because domestic violence is preventable and it is a cycle that can break. The role of the parent in the National Parenting Support Commission Act highlights that the parent is to uphold the rights and promote the interests of the child. They are to ensure that children are loved. They are to ensure that children are provided with the resources that they need to thrive and ensure that children are safe and protected. Often when we hear these roles, sorry, often when we hear these roles, we think in terms of physical, we um, were to put, make sure our kids are clothed and make sure that they're fed and make sure that they go um, to school, but we miss out on what is actually the crux of the role of the parent is to develop a healthy, safe, loving, nurturing um, relationship with the child and create a loving and safe and protective environment. And when we're talking safety, I'm not talking just in terms of physical safety, I'm talking emotional safety and emotional protection so that children are not being called 
names that take away from their value and their worth. They're not experiencing physical abuse that physically harms them. And they're not seeing people within their environment being physically abused or experiencing emotional abuse. We, in our policy goals, all Jamaicans are to make wise decisions about becoming parents and making parenting a priority. This policy goal speaks to that having a child, even though often it happens unplanned in many relationships, is that this is something that we can take a step back and we can start to make a more wise decision about it. Who am I going to be having children with? Is this person that I, have, I can have a safe, loving, respectful relationship with? Um, where we value and we cherish each other? Is this person going to be an effective parent for any children that we might have together? Do we share common values and can we together create an environment that will allow children to thrive and grow to be the best um, version of themselves that they can be? Also making parenting priority means that when you become a parent, your first job is to make sure that that child is taken care of. It's no longer about you. Everything now revolves around that child and making sure that they are now valued, loved, and taken care of. And that that is actually your legacy, meaning that how you love and value your children and what you pour into them, it speaks of who you are and who you were as a parent. So once parenting becomes a priority, it starts to shape all of the decisions that we make. It can shape where we go to work. It shapes the relationships that we have. It shapes the decisions that we make about what we want our kids, to, our children to experience. It shapes about who we want to come into our home and who do we want to have as close friends and close intimate partners. Because when we understand that children are the priority and they, they um, start to imitate what we do as parents, then it starts to change how we see um, our role and what we do. The next part of our social of our policies is that all children are loved, nurtured, protective, instinctively um, and unconditionally by their parents. This comes out in the elements of effective parenting. The elements of effective parenting is the basis for all parenting styles. And even we uh, at the National Parenting Support Commission, we actually promote the use of the authoritative parent because that parenting style uses all four of these elements in balance. What the role of the parent is, is to establish nurturance. When you hear nurturance, parents that are here this afternoon, what, what comes to mind? Feel free to type it in the chat. What words come to mind when you hear nurturing? Food, yes. What else? So we have food, anything else? Is food the only part of nurturing our children? Hugs, excellent cuddling, beautiful. Beautiful, so some of that emotional, when you pour into their lives for sustenance, yep. Anything else? Hugs and kisses, yes, yes. Hugs and kisses, it's important for encouragement, excellent. Respect, yep, yep, excellent. These are all, these are all quality, um, characteristics of nurturance. Another characteristic of nurturance is belonging. It's, a, it's accepting the children for who they are, where they are right now, knowing that they're gonna change as they grow older, that they're not gonna stay where they are. So maybe right now they're refusing to do anything that you tell them, but it's accepting that that's where they are right now and working with them for where they are right now. It's not seeing yourself and your unmet goals and your own aspirations in them and wanting them to accomplish them. It's looking at who that child is right here. Safety and consistency, exactly. Ms. Foster, I want you to really hold on to that, especially for when we talk about, um, talk about structure, because safety and consistency is very much key for child development. So that nurturance means um, it is also creating that environment where everybody in the home is also nurtured. So not only are children feeling the nurturance and feeling the love, the acceptance, and feeling that they belong, but it's also seeing that everybody else in the family is also loved and nurtured and that it's a safe environment 
because the home is that first place of socialization for children. And when they're not receiving belonging and acceptance in their homes, then they start to look outside of their family for that. And the places which they look for it, you may not like. That's why domestic violence is so, so challenging for children and so confusing because they're not seeing love and acceptance because love and acceptance does not mean hurting another person physically or verbally. Structure is our next element and Miss Foster beautifully led us into there when she said um, consistency and safety. We often think of structure in terms of rules and boundaries um, discipline structure, so everybody knows what the rules are and they know what's going to happen when they don't meet the rules and they receive the guidance that they need to be able to, um, to meet the rules of the home. And we see structure in all of our environment. So when we go to work every day, we have a structure that we have to abide by. We have to be at work by a certain time. We're only allowed to take lunch at a certain time with maybe 30 or minutes to 60 minutes at the most. And we're to leave work at a certain time. We're not supposed to leave before that unless we have permission. And then there's rules within the, our workplaces that guide how we conduct our work, how we dress, and how we conduct those relationships. That's structure, that's boundaries. And when those are not met, then there's consequences. When you drive on the road, the Road Code Act got, provides the structure for how we are to conduct ourselves as drivers. It's the same thing in, that ho in the home. The home needs to have structure in terms of these are the routines that, and these are the behaviors that are expected in the home. These are the boundaries that we have, and these are the um, rules. And this is what happens when those rules are broken. And this is the guidance that you're going to receive to help you to abide by the rules of our home, but also allowing them to have a say. And what Ms. Foster then highlighted was safety and consistency because children thrive in structure and they thrive in stability. So structure speaks to stability. And in families that have domestic violence, there is not that stability because the children do not know what's going to happen. And even though there's an abuse cycle and they can sense when things are gonna to start to go wrong, it still makes them start to feel unsafe and unsure because they don't know when it's going to happen. And it doesn't give that safety. Our next element of effective parenting I want to go to is recognition. Recognition is seeing our children for who they are. And again, that nurturance part of accepting them for who they are. There's a saying, seven brothers with seven different minds. Recognition is understanding that each child in your home is different from the next child. They think reason, they think differently, they reason differently. Um, that, eat, that if you ask them about a situation, they're going to have a different thought and a different perspective and a different opinion. And recognize, recognition means parenting that child for who they are, not for who their brother or sister is, and not who we want them to be, but for who they are right now. And parenting each child based on their own individual needs and their own individual personalities. Recognition also means, parents, that we are praising them when they do good things. Because part of our job that we learned in nurturance is really making sure that our children feel loved and valued. As I, in my own journey as a parent, it's called keeping my children's love tank full. Because when children are recognized for the things that they do well, they're more likely to do it. Um, if they keep receiving punishment and negativity back, then they're, they're going to continue to do it because they're not motivated. They haven't been praised. Recognition also means parents that you're recognizing when your child isn't doing well. You're recognizing when things are impacting them in a negative way. In the case of domestic violence, it means recognizing that the, re the environment of the family is now toxic to the child and is having a negative impact on them. And then moving towards making changes for the health of not only the parent who's being um, abused, but also for the health and the well-being of the children. Recognition now is connected to empowerment. And I'm going to throw it back to you. When you hear empowerment, parents, what do you hear? Empowerment, what do you hear? Anyone? Okay, so empowerment is equip giving our children the skills and the resources that they need to, to thrive and to, to develop to be the best version of themselves. 
Empowerment means teaching our children, not just with our words, but with our actions, how to solve problems. Affirm, affirmation of their ability or their individuality. That's right. Exactly. It is that affirmation of their ability and their individuality. It's also um, giving them the resources. So for example, if your child is very good at playing football, it might mean finding a team that they can play on or finding a coach who can help develop that skills. Um, in with now that schooling is going on, um, been online, I hear a lot of um, parents talking about their children going and playing video games instead of being in class. If, your child, if you see that your child is really interested in um, video games, then maybe it might be helping them to explore what it can be to become a video game, um, a creator of a video game or a software engineer. That's right, it's giving your kids the tools to become their best version of themselves. And we give the tools by um, modeling it for them, by spending time talking with them and playing with them and interacting with them, and by our resources of our time and our finances. But the empowerment comes by recognizing as what Ms. Foster said, their individuality. So looking at when you're in a domestic violence case, are you modeling effective um, management of emotions? Are you modeling for your children how to solve conflicts and how to solve problems? Because those are crucial parts of empowerment. Earlier it was asked, and sometimes one of the things that we have a hard time understanding is why a person stays in domestic violence? Why don't they just get why don't they just get up and why don't they just leave? Why don't they just come to their senses and, and see that this is not good and it's not good for their children? It's important for us to be able to understand the mind of a person who is involved in domestic violence and the environment that their children are, um, are in. In the previous presentation, um, it was talked about how um, with boys that they can start to feel emasculated. When a man starts to feel emasculated, it's another sense of feeling that they're not a man and that they can't control and they can't change their environment. So they can start to develop what is called learned helplessness. When a child is involved in a situation that is continuously negative, or even as adults were involved in situations that are continuously negative, what starts to happen is that we believe we believe that we have little or no control of what happens to ourselves and in their life, in, in our lives. So, in, so instead of trying to figure out how to get out, we figure out how can we cope. So for a child who is abused, they might say, well, maybe if I do this for daddy, maybe daddy won't hit me, or maybe mommy won't call me names. Um, for a person who has been experiencing abuse, they often feel that it's their fault. So even though people on the outside can say, no, see how that person is wicked. They shouldn't be doing that. For the person who is involved in it, they often feel that it's their own fault. And maybe if they didn't say this, then they wouldn't have been hit. Maybe if they didn't, maybe if they had have just done what they were told, then they wouldn't have been beaten. They wouldn't have a bruise on their face. They wouldn't have ended up in the hospital. Um, so what's vital to understand is, and it connects to what you call an internal locus, meaning how much does a person feel that their beliefs and their values that they can control their environment and what happens to them. So when we're looking at our children and we're looking at the behaviors in which we're modeling for them, we're using the elements of effective parenting, which is valuing our children as individuals, valuing their thoughts and their opinions and allowing them to have a say and to contribute to the family environment and feel that they belong then it's now teaching our children that they have a sense of control and a sense of mastery, and it helps them to form their own identity. When we're not allowing them and we keep them in these consistently negative situations and they're trying and trying and trying, they start to feel that there's nothing that they can do. And it's the same thing with the person who's involved in domestic violence, that they often feel that there's nothing that they can do. So the question then becomes, how can we help people who have been in domestic violence and how can we help them with their children so that the cycle is broken, not just for that individual, but for the generations to come? The first element is that we need to understand the role of the parent and the elements of effective parenting. 
once we understand the role of the parent and understand that we can make wise decisions about parenting, that we um, that once we're a parent, it really isn't about us anymore, that everything that we do impacts our children and we're constantly modeling for them and they're imitating our behavior, then we start to allow our behaviors and our decisions to change so that it's in more in the best interest of the child and in the health of the child. The next thing I want to do is build that strong parent-child relationship because that parent-child relationship is what helps to shape them mentally, emotionally, and physically and insulate them from, especially when they go into the teen years, from all of the negative behaviors and all of the toxicity that they can often see in the environment around them. It helps them to shape healthy values and become healthy functioning adults who have their own healthy families. The next thing is, is that person who is being abused needs to recognize that the violence towards you, it's not your fault. So even if you did cheat, it does not mean that you shouldn't have, that you, that you deserve to be hit or you deserve to be called names. It doesn't mean that because you didn't have supper on the table at five o'clock or you didn't make a meal that they liked, that you deserve what happened. You did not deserve that. And it's not your fault because in instance of domestic violence, no matter how good you do, no matter how perfect you are, it will still happen because it's not about your behavior. It's about what's going on inside of that individual and that individual needs help. And then the last, which brings us to the last point is to be able to seek counseling support for the parents and for the children. For the parents means support for the parent who is being abused and support for the parent who is abusing and then counseling for the children so that they can help to process what they've experienced and start to build and repair those, those relationship models that they, were, um, that they were seeing from within their family so that they can start to relearn so that they themselves, when they become parents and when they become involved in intimate relationships, they don't continue in the same pattern that they watch their parents or their step parents go through. The places in which we can see assistance for domestic violence, we heard um, actually the majority of these um, in our previous presentation. So we have the Women's Crisis Center, which is a 24 seven, 24 hour, seven day a week hotline. The Bureau of Gender Affairs has the Women's Crisis Line. And as we heard, um, they have a shelter, a national shelter and the interventions that the Bureau of Gender Affairs does are very well thought out interventions to really help people leave domestic violence situations. Also of importance is the hotline for men who are experiencing domestic violence and who want to make a report so that they themselves can also get help. The Women's Outreach Resource, on the screen you see the phone number for the Trelawney um, Ministry of Justice Office, the Victim Services Division, who will provide counseling for the whole of the family, the Women's Media Watch Group, and of course, you can for parenting support, by all means, you can contact us at the National Parenting Support Commission. We're located at 37 Arnold Road, which is the Canewood Center on, in Kingston. Our office phone number is 876 967-7977. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you see parent support helplines. Those are helplines that are available 24 seven for parents who are wanting assistance and psychosocial support in through the challenges of being a parent. Um, I throw it up to you now and I'm open for questions or comments. Any questions, any comments? Yes, Mr. Carter. I was really hoping that other persons would have asked ahead of me, but anyway, let me ask. Um, I've had, had the experience where um, me and my wife were having a conversation. We're not arguing, we're having a conversation, but my son, for some strange reason, usually comes and he, he either push me away or try to you know, stop the talking daddy. But I'm, 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 it's not something, it's not like we're there arguing or anything like that. But I heard in a presentation where you said uh, something like the, the child is usually going to rush to protect the person being abused. But in his mind, what I'm saying, I'm looking at the, 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 his development and I'm saying that he's protecting his mother. Mm -hmm. He don't make me eat food in the house. 
Right, but he, 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 if he, if your mother tell him to hit me, he'll do it. If I tell him, if I jokingly say, "Hey, hit your mommy," he's not gonna do it. Mm. So I'm looking at that. I mean, I don't have the girl yet, but I'm looking at that, and I'm saying, you know, have you have you noticed anything in 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 regards to your studies where where especially boys and the mother, the connection with the mother and and men with the connections with the daughter? Was there anything in your studies that would indicate, um, you know? indicate something in that era? I can't speak specifically to a study um, on it, but as a general um, observation, boys tend to have more of, a, well, Freud probably talks about it more, um, but I'm not an expert in Freud, um, but boys have a tendency towards a stronger connection with moms and girls tend to have a, 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 connection, a stronger connection with their fathers. Um, children are, especially when they're young, they're very attuned to their environment. Um, we think that because they're a baby that they don't, they're not aware of what goes on, but that's not true. Um, when, even when they're babies, they're highly sensitive to what's going on in their environment, any kind of conflicts, any type of, when their parents are happy, they're very attuned to the emotional regulation of those that are in their environment. And they're attuned because all of their needs and they're, because they're solely dependent upon those caregivers. So when you get a baby, a baby can't dress itself. It can't feed itself. It can't change its own diaper. It can't go to the bathroom by itself. It's dependent upon us as parents to do that. And it's depend, and it's when we're looking at Eric Erickson, the very first stage of their development is, um, is trust versus mistrust. So they're learning at that stage if they can trust the world or if they're not gonna trust the world, which then impacts the rest of the development. But what happens is because they're solely dependent upon us as parents, they are literally, like they have these antennas up that we don't see um, that are extremely attuned to everything that is going on. So when your son is starting to move protectively towards his mom, part of that is that he might perceive you as a threat towards his mom and he's protective, which is not a bad thing, it's actually good. Um, but you kind of want to balance it out a little bit so that he's also protective of you. The other part about it too, and also the other key with it is not even just protective of you and protective of mom, but children need to stay in their roles. Sometimes what happens in domestic violence and in abuse is that we have what's called role reversal starts happening where children start to take on adult roles. So when children are having to step in to try to protect mom, they're now taking on the role of the adults, which is not their job. It is not their job to protect mom. It's not their job to protect dad. It is their job. It's actually mom and dad's job to protect their children. Um, so you can, you know, you might want to look at, okay, what tone of voice am I using? Um, you might want to get his mom to say, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm all right. I'm good. You know? Let's laugh and play because they really are attuned to everything that we do because their survival and their dependency is, is um, based on it. Does that help you, sir? Yes, yes, it did. Okay, let me go into the chat. Okay. Does our unit collaborate with the Children's Services Division? Um, we do, we do work with other agencies within the um, parenting sector. We receive referrals and we would, when we receive referrals, then we would work with them. Yes, we definitely can conduct more of these sessions across the country. We actually do um, parenting education sessions throughout the country because we are a national agency um, on different topics that affect parenting. So for example, with um, National Parenting Month in November, our, and actually throughout this year, our goal was to um, empower fathers to continue in the role of being a father and to strengthen fathers in continuing to, to be active fathers in their lives. So we have a presentation around um, supporting and calling fathers to be more involved and more engaged. We've, throughout COVID-19, we've been doing presentations on coping mechanisms for parenting um, recognizing that this has been a very challenging time for us as individuals and it strains our ability to parent our children. So 
trying to look at ways to um, so strengthen our coping mechanisms so that we can continue to provide loving and safe environments for our children and then how we help them to cope with with COVID-19, which has been a big deal. Um, we do presentations on discipline. We do presentations on different um, on different age groups as well. And so anytime we're invited, um, we will come out to an organization and do parenting education sessions. So again, the phone number on the screen, I'll put it back up. You can contact us. Um, let me share it back. There, if you're interested in um, a presentation within your organization. Um, it doesn't necessarily, um, Nelson, it doesn't necessarily mean that his tone was a little harsh. Um, <laughs> It, um, children just run to do that. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever observed where, um, when uh, two parents might be kissing, young children will come in and try to push them apart. Um, so even in healthy displays of um, affection, sometimes children will come and try to be, uh, try and push parents apart. So in those kind of situations, we say, no, hug them too and include them in those displays of affection. So it might be that his tone was harsh, but it might be that he's, he's taking care of his mom. You're welcome, Mr. Montague. Yes. Mm -hmm. And sons do it too. And then sometimes when they're older, they'll start to tell their parents to kiss or their hug. And then at some point tell them they'll be grossed out if their parents do that. The biggest thing with conflict in the home parents is, is conflict, it really affects children. Um, and even when you're managing conflict in the home, um, not only is it from the place of modeling that we learn from Bandura that our children imitate and model their behavior, but it's also this place of emotional safety and keeping children in their roles. When we as adults are having discussions and having problems um, between each other as adults, that's not, um, that's not the place for children. So it's either having those discussions away from the ears of children or having those conversations and sorting out those problems in a respectful, loving fashion. And it's a mutually respectful, loving fashion um, because children, their safety feels threatened because it really is their safety, their sense of being at young ages is really dependent upon us as parents. So we want to remind our children that no, these are big people problems and we as adults, we've got everything under control. When children feel that we've got everything in control, then they can take a deep breath and go back to doing what they're supposed to be doing as kids, which is playing, exploring the environment, testing the rules and the boundaries that we put down um, in place, doing their homework. Those go back to being what a, 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 ch a child is supposed to be, which is a child not getting in the way and helping parents solve their problems, which is really an adult level conversation, not a child and adult conversation. And then helping them, children, to make meaning in appropriate ways of the conflict or the disagreement that they might have seen between parents. These are, these are good things for our kids to be seeing. It, it's good within reason for our kids to be seeing um, their parents to put, displaying affection towards each other. It helps, again, it helps create that safety and that sense of, oh, okay, relationships are supposed to be loving. They are supposed to be respectful. Any other questions? Uh, wanted to get your, your view of co-parenting. Yes. Yeah, what, what's it, what do you, do you are you- specific? Well, I noticed you didn't, you didn't mention co-parenting in your, in your presentation. So is it that you're not, you're not necessarily fans of it? Um, we would be very much fans of positive co-parenting. Um, the key with co-parenting, um, co-parenting usually happens when relationships are over. Um, so the key with co-parenting is keeping the best interests of the child first and foremost, um, and coming from a respectful and a mature place. Um, so it's good for children to be able to see their parents coming together and solving problems and taking care of them together, even though they may not be together as a couple. But co-parenting needs to be um, positive. 
And it needs to have at the very first and foremost, the child's best interest. It's not about what he did as to why the relationship ended. It's not what about she did. That's outside of the parenting relationship. That's the parent's relationship between themselves. And that's not supposed to come in and impact your ability to parent. So co-parenting means having mutual goals, mutual interests about the child, having an agreed upon um, way that you guys are going to raise your children together, even though it's in two separate homes. Co-parenting means not putting that child in between two parents um, and making that child feel like they have to choose between one or the other. Because if a child starts to feel that they have to choose between one parent or the other, research shows that that's what's called high conflict or loyalty binds, and that is um, more damaging to a child than even abuse. Um, so that is so those loyalty binds. What you always want your child to know is that even though I don't live with you, I love you, and I'm still part of your life. And for as parents, for the parent who may the child might reside with the majority of the time making sure that they're not going to get in the way of the other parent's relationship. So even if money may not be sent, even if, um, you know, they don't show up in the time that you think that they show up, should show up, it would be understanding that parenting goes beyond finances. Um, parenting goes, is about a relationship and finances are important, but the relationship is also very crucial. Um, so having an active and engaged father or an active and engaged mom, even though they're not living together, is very important. So kind of putting your axes to grind with each other aside in the best interest of the child and peacefully co-parenting. Yes, Ms. Foster, we do have those as well. We do have planned workshops as well. But as I said, we are open. Um, you can find us on Twitter and you can find us on Instagram. And you'll see the workshops that we do that is open more to the public, then you'll see them advertised there as well. But we also do invitation too. Okay, noted. Okay, any other questions, comments? All right, thank you so much for your time and thank you for your questions um, and for your comments. I really hope that today you came away learning how um, domestic violence impacts children and how we can work towards preventing um, this cycle and stopping this cycle in future generations. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Cheryl Bedminton. That was a very profound educational presentation. And I hope those of us who are listening or tuned in we benefit from some of the facts that you have put over to us. And to show our appreciation, we are a little gift for you. So happy reading, and I'm sure you will enjoy it. It was very good for us to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, we're gonna have the item now. Okay, we're ready for the second item and it's, a recorded poem by Octavia Foster. We are linking it now, so you'll see it in a moment. And Ms. Foster is also a member of the group, Lab Advocacy Committee and um, Gender Equity Team. And she is not in Ireland, even though she's very active in asking questions online. We want to thank her for joining us. Mm -hmm. And she was kind enough to pre-record and send. And so here now we listen to her. From creation, you were divine. Not an error nor a crime, but a marvelous manifestation of life. You were deliberate and intentioned wired and carved for purpose according to the master's plan you are salt you are savor you were made to balance all in god's favor houses are empty without your voice women are lonely without you as their choice children are sad because they're missing a dad don't ever believe those lies that you're only but a fad a lot rests upon your shoulder, that I won't deny. Life is always a hustle, because much is expected of you. 
But hey, if ever you feel for a cuddle, it's okay to do that too. Come to the table. We are waiting for you. That was a lovely poem. Thank you very much, Miss Foster. Those words were very meaningful and I could feel the vibes. Now we're going to be having our, now we're going to have Christine Dawkins doing a vote of thanks. Greetings to you all. Both those of you that are viewing us on Zoom and those that are here today, face to face. I am Christine Dawkins. I have been given this privilege to give you thanks and be off of the Falmouth Library Advocacy Committee and, and Wellness in Motion Gender Equity Team. I very much like to express thanks to you, Ms. Nadia McLaren, Acting Director, Community Liaison at the Bureau of Gender Affairs. You have taken the time out to present to us needed and crucial information focusing on the issue of gender violence, prevention, restoration, and support. This is a serious issue world over, and so we are all affected. You said no excuse for abuse. Domestic violence should not be a private matter. Everyone should really be involved. I am sure we will leave here understanding more what gender violence is and how we can seek needed help, as well as the willingness to help others. Thank you again. I also am now giving thanks to Ms. Cheryl Bobbington, Social Worker of National Parenting Support Commission and Agency of the Minister of Education, Youth and Information. You spoke also on domestic violence through parenting lenses. The examples set by parents are modeled by children and shape the behavior of the child. Parents would have understand that the environment they created, the example that they set in training their children matters socially, emotionally, mentally, and physically. They would also learn elements of effective parenting and they, that they can implement. I am sure that all our parents and those who are on video today, supporters of this event, were all inspired by your great words. Thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Dawkins. And now we're going to be having our closing remarks from our chairman, Dr. Ashe Mwendo. Okay, we have come to the end of a wonderful, wonderful session. And I want to thank everyone who joined with us today. And we look forward to being with you again in August because this is a session we will be continuing over and over. And so the next session will be in August. You'll get the date, you'll get the invitation. And as I just put in the chat, we'll be looking at um, thanking Alan for helping us to start the conversation in talking about, that's what we're going to talk about, co-parenting and also blended families. And how do we navigate that area for the benefit of the children and all parents involved. So I want to thank you for being with us. We know this session we have started at 11 and it's now 2. So we were willing right within the timeline that we have set. And we want to thank Ms. McLean and Ms. Bebbington for coming on so willingly. And also I want to extend a special, special thank you to Mr. Garland McDonald also, who he was the first person I reached out for from his association. And he kindly guided me in ensuring that we, the partnership took place. And so I want to acknowledge him. And then there are some other members of the team that I know is on from different organizations. I want to thank all members of the team that are on from the library. I want to thank from head office, Demar Cornwall. He's in director of public library network. I should have given that name to our person who give the vote of thanks, but forgive me, madam, for not doing so timely. 
And so also for me, want to thank Miss Casey Carr and Miss Sherry Brown and, and Miss Andrine Taylor. I want to thank all these persons for making sure that this happened today. I want to thank the team at Bureau of Gender Affairs. We have a good relationship. And I know most times I just send WhatsApp messages and we communicate and things happen. So I want to thank everyone who come on, take time out, enjoy your lunch. And we will continue the conversation later on. We also want to thank Ms. Dish, um, Sophia Lishu for these wonderful books. If you have not gotten a copy yet, I'm telling you, you should. We'll get information out to you how to get them because Ms. Lishu, you are here. Please come and tell persons how they can get your book. It is really worth reading. She was on my program, Healing Moments, and persons have been reaching out to know more. So please tell persons. Yes, you may contact me via WhatsApp at 474-5546. I am also on Facebook. Sophia Lee Shu Palmer, and the book is also available on Amazon. It's only 10 US dollars if you are ordering directly from Amazon, but if you reach out to me, it's only 1500 Jamaican dollars. All right, and wherever you are in Jamaica, I can also zip mail your book right to your door. All right, have a great day. Thank you, Doctor. You're most welcome. So thank you. Any final words, any question you want to have? If not, we thank you for joining us and we say walk good.